Thank you everybody for joining us today. I am very honored to welcome you, our speaker for the day, Dr. Mohammed Ramawi. Welcome. Thank you for having me, I appreciate you. Thank you, so can you start off by giving us a little introduction? Who are you and what do you do? Yeah, so as you mentioned, my name is Mohammed Ramawi. I'm actually a podiatrist practicing in New York City. I saw a couple people from Jersey and Long Island in the chat, that's pretty cool. Um, but welcome to everybody. Uh, I've been practicing for about three years now. Uh, I finished my residency in 2018 and I jumped straight into private practice since then. Um, you know, podiatry is something that I stumbled upon in college and haven't turned back since. So uh, I'm hoping that students today will be able to kind of gauge what kind of field I'm into. And if it's something they're interested in, they're more than, help, uh, more than willing to ask a few questions along the way. So, so I'm trying to keep this as, as, as formal, but as straightforward as possible with everybody here. I'm, I'm sure you guys are in a stage in your careers or your lives where you're very impressionable, right? You wanna make the right decision. You've worked very hard up until this point, okay? And you don't wanna uh, drop the ball by picking the wrong specialty, the wrong field, and you don't wanna hit 10 years later and say, oh my God, I wish I would have done differently, okay? So I'm gonna give you everything, my spiel, this is my personal take from how I got into podiatry, where I'm at today, and maybe this is something you guys can relate to, okay? Um, so podiatry wasn't something obviously that was in my uh, thinking since I was in high school or something, right? It's not every boy or girl's dream to grow up to be a podiatrist. Most people don't know what podiatry is, right? You kind of stumble upon it one way or another. Uh, I always wanted to do surgery, more specifically orthopedic or sports medicine type of surgery, okay? I was always involved in sports and athletics and stuff and other things in that nature. So that was the plan the whole way through. And when I got to college, it wasn't until my sophomore year that my counselor at the time introduced me to a field of podiatry. So I started to do my research. And to be quite honest with you, before then, I always thought as podiatry as something simplistic, like chiropathy work. You know, they see the elderly, they, they cut toenails, they take care of small blisters, marathons, whatever it may be. Uh, the more research I did into the field, the shadowing and uh, following all the doctors, I realized that they're pretty much equipped to do anything related to the lower extremity, from surgery to wound care to pediatrics to diabetics, you name it, anything with the foot and ankle related, they're trained to do so, okay? So I started to compare, I, I, what's, what's the best route for me to go? I'm taking the MCATs regardless, right? MCATs is the most stressful time in, in your college career in preparation for medical school, so you start... Uh, investing in it and you, you say, hey, um, what am I going to do after this? Uh, in terms of my major in college, this is actually uh, out the blue. I was a business major in college, okay? Uh, one of the biggest things I didn't want to do was catch myself in a hole. So a lot of times I saw people older than me, they would become biology majors and there's nothing wrong with that. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that, okay? But it's the safe bet. You become a biology major and you set yourself up for when you do go get to med school because some of the classes you take in biology, you're gonna repeat them come your med school year. So you're already prepared, okay? But I started telling myself, um, if medical school, God forbid, doesn't work out, what can I do with my biology degree? And I just didn't see myself getting my master's, becoming a teacher, going into research. I, I just couldn't imagine that. So I went into business and for the longest time, um, I was enjoying it thoroughly, okay, to be quite honest with you. I always wanted, knew that medicine was for me, but I wanted to kind of diversify my, my assets or my education. And uh, business, I don't regret it. I doubled up on credits almost every semester, so it was a little gruesome, but it was a, a point of conversation every interview I had. Oh, that's not something we see every day, a business major, there's so and so forth and so forth. And when someone's interviewing you when you're a business major, they don't have much to ask, right? Whereas if you're a biology major, they're going to drill you on a few things or a chemistry major. Oh, I was a chemistry major. What did you do for your thesis or so forth? You know, no one's ever going to ask me about my major. What did I write on? I did, just not a topic, but uh, I digress. Um, so it was my uh, sophomore year in college preparing for my MCATs. And I was going through the different ideas in my head. Is it going to be orthopedics? Is it going to be sports medicine? Is it going to be this new thing called podiatry that I just discovered? Okay. Um, and this is where the segment of life and career kind of play in balance, all right? So not to get too personal, but I'm the, the eldest child of immigrant parents, okay? 
And what that means is they're waiting for you to support the family. That's, that's just the reality of it. They're just waiting for you. And orthopedics, when I started to look at the route you go to, it's, it's pretty gruesome, okay? It, it's one thing to match into a medical school, which is very competitive, obviously. It's another thing to match into an orthopedic residency or a residency you actually want to go to, right? Say if you uh, want to stay in a specific geographic area or a certain region in the United States, you know, you make your chances that much harder because there's so many people competing for that same exact spot, Okay. And then after that, I realized it's about a five-year residency for orthopedics or things like sports medicine. I said, man, that's, that's pretty long. You know, my debt is accruing. I'm not making good salary because God knows residents are underpaid and overworked. I started to think, man, the, my, the business side of me was saying my return on my investment isn't really good. If you calculate how many years you put in schooling, the debt you just accrued, and the fact that you're doing five years of residency, which is low pay and, and hard work started to think, hmm, this, this seems a little bit off. And then the, the cherry on top was, in terms of orthopedics, if I wanted to do something like the foot and ankle or you know shoulders or whatever it may be, now a lot of people expect you to do another year of fellowship, which again, is a competitive field. You're competing, all competing for the very same spots. And again, you're doing, uh, um, letting your debt accrue and you're, what's it called? Um, just waiting until you hit your big bang. So for me, at that time, it just didn't make sense. Podiatry, on the other hand, was three years of residency, and that's it. You're ready to go. Enter the real world, start making your adult money. The debt was much, much cheaper in comparison to your standard medical school or um, other facilities. So I started to ask myself, what's best, what's not best, and uh, ultimately, I made the choice of podiatry, Okay. Uh, three years later, or six years later down the line, I, it, it seems I still agree with that choice, and I'll, I'll explain why. Um, within podiatry, you'll learn very quickly, and that's why I, I would uh, um, urge people to speak to multiple podiatrists. There are many different niches in the field, okay? It's not like one-size-fits-all approach when it comes to foot and ankle medicine. There's so many different things that you will be trained at uh, cumulatively, but you'll be focused on something specific. So, if you want to focus on sports medicine, you kind of orient your practice to sports medicine or you orient your uh, training, residency training in a sports medicine field. If you wanted to do like wound care, then you go through wound care. If you wanted to do limb salvage, you could do limb salvage. You say, hey, I just want to uh, deal with kids and do pediatrics. And there's a whole division for that. Dermatology and so forth and so forth. Okay. So the idea of pediatry that I liked was you're never going to be bored. Okay, if you follow a, a private practice clinician, they'll see an array of things. One patient will come in with a fracture, one patient will come in with an ingrown toenail, one patient will need a reconstructive surgery, one patient will need something as simple as orthotics. Um, and you'll have to be on your feet, no pun intended, every single time someone walks in. And for me, that was, that was appealing in that sense. Um, now, in terms of how it works after residency, after three years of residency, there is a fellowship course that you can take, and that fellowship can also gear you towards whatever you may want to be, whatever wound care, traumatology, and so forth. And after fellowship or residency, whatever you decide to do, there are different routes. Now I chose private practice, but people can do other things. They can work hospital-based. They can work private group-based. They can work multi-specialty group. They can work for ortho practice. The, less, the list is endless, okay? And that's what was appealing about podiatry for me. It was just, hey, if I didn't like one route in the field, I can go to another. If I wanted something that was diverse, I can have that as well. Um, and it, so far, it's worked out for me uh, as well. Now, I see there's a, a few questions that have popped up. Uh, I'm willing to do them if they're in related to what we're talking about right now. I haven't read them, actually. Um, could you describe the difference between a chiropodist and a podiatrist? That's a great question. So chiropody is a very old school term, rarely used ever uh, in the U.S. at least, okay? Maybe used in the U.K. and other areas. Uh, chiropody was given to the original podiatrists, right? The OGs of the, um, the field, okay? Uh, these were people who maintained the foot and ankle care, you know? They, they had the stereotypical... Um, uh, description. They used to do the toenails for the elderly in the nursery homes. They used to take care of the blisters, the ingrown toenails, and so forth. But as the field became advanced, surgery began to become incorporated, right? And they started doing things like the orthopedics did. 
So they moved away from this term chiropody and now they're termed podiatrist. So podiatrist in, in terms of the United States encompasses everything in relation to the foot and ankle. It's just not palliative care, but you're mandated to have surgical training in residency as well. Um, I'm not sure what the end of that said, uh, that statement was. Um, in terms of debt as, uh, for medical school and podiatry school, podiatry school, depending on where you go. So that's a great segue. There are nine different podiatry schools in the United States of America. And I'm going to keep this to the U.S. because that's what I know best, okay? Um, depending on which area you want to go in, that's going to factor how much debt you accrue, right? So there is a school in New York, and I'm from New York. So you save a ton on living expenses, travel expenses, whatever you may be. And the debt itself, I believe, is 24 to 26 grand per year without scholarships. Now, if you did well in college, you'll be getting your scholarships. If you do well in school, you'll add on scholarships to that as well. So theoretically, if everything goes as well, you can graduate with a debt uh, less than the triple digits or the mark of 100 grand. Um, and this is just something my business nature said. Uh, I always wanted something close to a one-to-one -one debt to ratio. So I wanted to know that the average debt and the average salary are about one-to-one, -one, okay? So if I'm going to graduate with 100 grand in debt, my starting salary better be around that number, okay? Because it's going to take a long time to pay that off because, you know, interest doesn't spare anybody, right? Student loan forgiveness is a big thing. It's a hot topic. And it doesn't look like, look like we're going anywhere with that. So you have to protect yourself and protect your interest in the long run, right? Uh, you never want to be a doctor who's 70. And I know people like this who are still trying to pay off debt, okay? Because then you just uh, put yourself in a vicious cycle. So you have to ask yourself these things when making decisions. I know people in, uh, in my circle who have gotten accepted to some amazing schools. But when they factor in the living costs, tuition costs, and so forth, it just makes more sense to stay local. Live with mom and dad, no problem. Get free food. Have someone do your laundry. All these things add up in the long run. Now, you may say, oh, I'm making a sacrifice now, but it may pay off in the long run. And th these are the factors that go into your uh, decision making, especially early on. You can't just say, I'm going to take the best school, the best resume, best job, best everything, and move forward with that. It has to be a pros and cons, and you have to have this balance between career and life. Okay, what's good for my career, but what's good for my personal life as well and my ambitions in the long run? What's going to help me get there? Okay, and, and you'll see this as you go through your applications and weigh out the pros and cons of each school, each facility, and the location of each one as well. Uh, I hope that answered that question. Um, I'm not sure if I could see the other questions here. Is there a possibility I could do that? And I'll just run through them, to be quite honest with you. Yeah, we can have our host. So Isaac and Raphael, if you guys want to go ahead and start asking um, the questions that have been dropped in the chat um, or the questions, um, the introduction questions, feel free. Um, can you talk about your admissions process to podiatry school? Yeah, admission, it's, it's pretty much the same as every other uh, school, even college or medical school, correct? So you take your MCATs, right? And that's the standard right now. You, you need an MCAT to get in, okay? And every application process is the same. You There are nine different schools. You apply to them each separately, okay? Um, you send out your application with your resume, your personal statements, your CV, and uh, your GPA. The whole nine yards gets shipped out, okay? Then you wait patiently for them to grant you an interview. Once you're granted an interview, that, that's all you, right? That's, that's, they see what they get and you have to really impress at, at that moment. Um, now for different uh, podiatry schools, you're gonna have to obviously fly out. So I'm in New York, for New York, I just took the train, but I also applied to other schools in Florida and Philadelphia. You travel, you fly out and you try to make the best appearance you can, but the admission process doesn't really differ from any other uh, school or specialty. Thank you. How many uh, podiatry schools did you apply to? I only applied to three. So if, if you were listening a little bit earlier, one of the biggest factors for me was geography, okay? I told myself a long time ago, I wanna be in New York. So how am I gonna set myself up to come back to New York, practice in New York, work in New York? The second thing for me is I wanna minimize my debt, okay? So the less I have to travel, the better, right? So if I went to school in California, 
when I come home for travels, guess what? That's a plane ticket each way. You know, uh, these things start to run in your mind. Whereas if I go to Philadelphia, it's a bus. You know, you take one of those mega buses for ten dollars and you call it a day. And I'm not trying to sound like cheap or frugal, but when you don't have the money, right? As a student, you think about these things, or at least you should think about these things. Um, but I was really, really uh, content on staying in New York, going to New York. I knew I had the resume for it. So honestly, I applied to New York and uh, Philadelphia and Florida just as backups, but I had no intention of going there. But I didn't let the interviewer know that, okay? When you interview with someone, you tell them, yes, I wanna be here. This is where I wanna go. I love Florida, I love the sun. Oh, I can't wait to come here. Um, and you know, th this is just unfortunately the kind of game we play to protect ourselves. Thank you. Can you talk about your day in the life and your job pre-COVID and post-COVID? It's a great question. Um, unfortunately for us here, we're in the mecca of Corona, right? New York has one of the highest death rates, one of the highest positive rates in the country, if not in the world as well. Um, for at one point, we had the second highest death rate in the world. Um, Pre-COVID, I mean, it was New York City. There was foot traffic, no pun intended, all day, every day, people shoulder to shoulder. Uh, you could smell the guy walking in front of you's breath if he breathes too hard, right? Uh, so it was great. Restaurants were packed, the practice was busy and the whole nine yards. But after COVID, tourism stops, people don't go into work, right? Because everybody's working from home. Uh, foot traffic is not as heavy as it was before. So things start to die down a little bit and you see that all across, especially in New York City. Um, so we felt it heavily here, and there's a lot of patients who need routine podiatry care, our elderly, our wound care patients, and they can't afford to miss visits. So they're starting to worsen as well, but um, COVID's definitely taken a negative toll on podiatry and, you know, the city in general. So there's definitely a stark difference between the two, but hopefully things will turn around, right? Thank you. How would you describe the work-life balance of a podiatrist? Phenomenal. I'll be honest with you. It's one of the best things I, 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 that led me to podiatry. This is a great question. And when I was going between orthopedics and podiatry, these are the questions I asked myself. What did I really want to do? Did I want to work 60 to 70 hours a week? The answer was no. I, I just purely didn't. I didn't want to take call. I don't want to be bothered on a Saturday or Sunday uh, where I have to drive into a hospital or any of that. Okay. I felt like I paid my dues in residency and I don't want to do that again. Whereas in podiatry, depending on how you want to structure your practice, you can work a 40 hour work week, make a decent living and go home and enjoy your family on Saturday, Sunday or Friday, Saturday, Sunday, however you choose to be. Um, again, podiatry is special in the, in the aspect that there's so many different fields within podiatry you can pursue. So if you're a hospitalist type of podiatrist where you're working in the hospital, you're going to get called on a Saturday, Sunday. Uh, if you take call on a hospital, you're going to get called. If you're more of a traumatologist in the foot and ankle, guess what? When there's an ankle fracture at one in the morning, you're the guy they're going to speak out to. And for some people, they want that lifestyle. They love it. It makes them feel like they're making a difference and whatnot. For me, career and life was a huge balancing act. Okay, I wanted to put in the work and pay my dues, but at the same time, I wanted to enjoy what I've done. So podiatry definitely offers that venue of career and life balance, if that's what you're looking for. Thank you. Uh, can you talk about your favorite case that you've ever been a part of? Uh, there's many humbling cases. Uh, luckily for me, I, I went to some amazing programs to do my surgical training. Um, but for me personally, uh, being an athlete in high school and, and a little bit in college, it's always nice when you can put an athlete back into his season. I'll give you one case that was in my first year of private practice. It was a junior in high school who uh, had what's called a Liz Frank injury. It's basically a severe sprain of the midfoot. There's a ligament that holds that whole complex together. When that ruptures, I mean, the whole thing is unstable, okay? It's a season ending surgery. And, you know, when you're in your junior season, some people may know this in the chat, that's when recruiters start to pay attention to you, especially going into your senior year. That's your make or break. So it was a very tough discussion with him and his father to let him know like, hey, your season's over now, but let's take care of you now so tomorrow you can shine bright. And after much rehab, uh, great surgery and so forth, he was able to get a division one scholarship and he actually sent me a copy of that in, in my uh, mail and I hung it up in my practice. So uh, I think that's one of my memorable ones, but th there's many you make along the way for sure. 
That's great. Um, a student says that they're applying for the up upcoming cycle to start in the fall. When would you say is too late to send in their application? Never. What do you have to lose? Nothing. What do you have to lose? Absolutely nothing. And what I would do is I would follow up. These, these institutions with podiatry are so small. Like my, my whole podiatry school was 300 to 400 students, right? If that, okay? So if you send in your application and call like four days later, someone will pick up, hey, my name is so-and-so. I sent an application and just wanted to see if it, if it arrived, if anybody is going to read it. One, it shows you're interested. Two, it's a follow-up on what you've done. I, I would never uh, hesitate to send something. What, again, back to my original answer, what do you have to lose at all? Um, can you talk about the most interesting case you've been a part of? Uh, so that's different between memorable, right? <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, a little bit. So I went to, uh, in my second and third year of training, I went to a facility called Jefferson Health in Philadelphia. That's where I did my surgical training. And that's a level true level two trauma center, I believe. And we saw everything in terms of ankle fractures and what's called open ankle fractures. That's when you have such a high velocity injury that the bones stick out of the skin and they therefore they call it open, open ankle fracture. Um, so those were one of the most satisfying procedures. I know that's probably not the greatest adjective to use, but to see a bone sticking out of a skin dislocated, the skin bruised and blistering, and for you to be able to reduce that and then three months later see them walking as if nothing happened, it's always a nice feeling to have those. And again, that's another aspect of podiatry, the trauma aspect that if you were really into, you could certainly produce, uh, pursue. How did you study for the MCAT? Oh, man, I took a course. I, I forgot what was the course I took, but I, I definitely paid for the course. Because when you talk about investments, that's an investment you want to make, right? Because at the end of the day, these are tests. You know, unfortunately, they don't they not only test your knowledge, but they test your test taking ability, right? So you could be the smartest guys. We all know somebody with a 4-0 who just bombs the MCAT. You say, oh, what was this guy cheating in college his whole life? I don't get it. You know, how do you get a 4-0? It's not that they don't, they're not smart or they don't have the knowledge. It's that they're just not good test takers, okay? So I took a course and they basically, it was the Princeton Review. There we go. And they teach you how to like take the exam, okay? And then I bought the simplistic books. I believe it was called Exam Crackers. Is, is that right? This is so many years ago. Yeah, Exam Crackers. I really liked them. It was straightforward, simple English. I studied that for about three, three four months. And you kind of just go with it. You know, with these tests in terms of knowledge, it's, it's not knowledge you're going to cram in. It's things you've already been preparing for all the years leading up to that. Um, can you talk about your experience as a podiatry resident? Yeah, podiatry resident was absolutely uh, brutal, right? Uh, now, there are some residencies that you will go to, and it'll be very chill and laid back, okay? Um, you come in, you do your job, you go home, and so forth. I kind of went to high-end programs uh, just because I wanted the experience. I wanted to open my eyes to different things and see if I would be interested in but um, yeah, you're gonna work hard. There are moments where you're gonna be up for 36 straight hours, depending on what residency you go to. I went to a trauma program and trauma doesn't stop. And I, I sympathize with those residents right now because December is busy season, because the floors are slippery. Car accidents, people trip and fall, you're gonna get fractures, you're gonna get open fractures, you're gonna get open wounds. So guess what? When they call podiatry, you have to answer. And these are urgent emergent cases. When you have an open fracture, fracture, you can't just say, oh, I'll, I'll see you tomorrow. Uh, call me in the morning. No, no. It's like, okay, let's go. I'll, I'll be there in an hour and we'll fix this thing up. All right. Um, so podiatry residency, get ready to work. You're not, you're not taking a break or you're not taking a shortcut by doing podiatry. Residency is, is just as brutal as any other residency, if not more. Thank you. Um, the next question is, do you work closely with physical therapists? 100%. Yeah, I actually just uh, spoke to a physical therapist before I jumped on to this. Uh, a lot of my post-op patients, especially my uh, sports patients, you know, if we're doing ankle repairs or ligament repairs and so forth, when I want to restore that motion and what's called proprioception, this is the body's balance in space, uh, I'm not going to do that in my office. I, I refer them to physical therapy. 
And when I do refer them to physical therapy, I, you know, you want to follow up with the patient. So I always make sure I discuss with the physical therapist, how's he doing? Is he improving? Uh, what can we work on? Is there anything I can do? Uh, phys physical therapy and I, I wish my physical therapist was on this as well. They could tell you we're hand in hand. I need them. They need me and we respect each other. So I have a lot of love and respect for physical therapists. Absolutely. Going off of that question, can you talk about the people that you usually work with or like a team that you work with and how that dynamic plays? Yeah, so it depends what kind of private or what kind of setting you're in, right? So if you're in a multi-specialty group, let's just use that example, okay? So in a multi-specialty group, they usually have internal medicine, vascular, dermatology, a little bit of everything, okay? And you're with podiatry. Guess what? You're very involved because the vascular doctor is going to say, hey, I think you need to see podiatry go down the hall, okay, make an appointment. Guess what? You're not even going to have to write this uh, doctor a letter. You're just going to walk down there and tell them, hey, can I give you an update on your patient? What are you doing? What are your plans? Let me tell you my plans and we can move forward, okay? Um, when you're in a pro solo practice setting, this symbiotic relationship still exists. So if I have a patient who needs surgery, the first person I'm going to talk to is their primary care. Is this, patiently, is this patient medically optimized for surgery? Yes, thank you. Post-surgery, you're going to work with physical therapy. Can we help restore the range of motion? Can we reduce the stiffness and so forth? In surgery, you're going to work with anesthesia, the nurses, and so forth. Um, you're never, it's, it's going to be hard for you to just kind of be in the corner and be a podiatrist by yourself. You're going to have to be open to working with other specialties because you're not going to know everything and you can't do everything on your own. So absolutely, there's a symbiotic relationship with all specialties involved. Definitely. The next question is, how competitive are the podiatry residency programs? Um, you know, when I was in school, they were very competitive because what we had was called a residency shortage. So there were too many students and not enough spots, right? And now there are different levels of how good some residencies are compared to the other. So obviously the top ones, everybody's gunning for them. And that's hard, right? Because these places have sometimes two spots, three spots, five spots. And you have everybody around the country gunning for these same five programs. So they can get very competitive. And, and we know as med students that uh, when things get competitive, some, some students get nasty, right? We call them gunners or cutthroat, right? Uh, do people still use that term or am I old school yet? Yeah, people still use that <laughs> okay. for pre-med too. <laughs> yeah, so they can get uh, very competitive. Last I read, right now, there isn't a residency shortage. There's enough spots for everybody. But again, if you want to pursue a certain niche, like I want to do trauma, I want to do sports medicine, I want to do wound care, those type of programs will be competitive, okay? There's, there's no sugarcoating that. Um, but if you just want to land a residency for the sake of landing a residency, yeah, you'll, you'll land one. There's a question in the chat. What would you say is the hardest part about your job? Uh, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Um, one thing they don't teach you in med school and they don't teach you in residency is when you, you go into private practice, it's not just medicine anymore, okay? There's a lot of different variables that go into a practice, keeping your employees happy, keeping the practice running, keeping the lights on, keeping patients satisfied. Because sometimes just making a patient feel better, um, whether their foot or ankle pain, isn't enough. Uh, you'll run into problems with their insurance carriers or billing issues and so forth. And these are things that residency and med school don't prepare you for. So you kind of learn about them on the fly, right? And you're going to have to make mistakes for, for you to actually get better and better at them. So I think that was the most difficult part or the hardest part of my job was transitioning everything that's outside of medicine and kind of learning it as I go, if that makes any sense. Thank you. The next question is, how is the process of starting a private practice and what led you through that path? So I always wanted uh, a private practice. Unfortunately for me, I'm, I'm very stubborn. This is a personality trait I've, I've come to admit with myself. I, I learned it in residency. I, I don't do well with taking orders from people. I just don't. I, I can't explain it. I, I wish I was better. I'm not. <laughs> so I knew for a fact I, I wouldn't be good in a setting where someone were going to tell me, you have to be at work at this time. You have to go home at this time. You get this many days off. Um, if you have to take off for a family issue, give me an advance notice, okay? And all that, I, I just couldn't do it. So when I was interviewing coming out of residency, I wanted to interview with a practice that was already on its way out 
and I would be able to take over that practice. And that was one of the first things I asked when I was being interviewed. And a lot of people were, you know, they were taken back by this question. Oh, what's the path to partnership? Oh, are you looking to sell this practice at some point? Some people don't like hearing that. But for me, I, I knew in order to be happy, that was something I needed to do. And to be quite honest with you, in order to start that private practice, um, I took a big hit in my salary coming out. Whereas my colleagues were making X amount of dollars, I was making X minus or X divided by two, right? And people say, oh, you took the lesser offer. What, what are you thinking? But again, this is the long run game. You're thinking ahead, all right? My goal is to own this practice. Let me take the hit now so in two years, I. I can say I'm my own boss and I don't have to worry about that. Um, now, there are different ways to go about it. More likely, you're going to buy someone out. You'll buy their patients, you'll buy their practice, their equipment, and so forth. That's the easier way. Some people do start absolutely from scratch. It's, it's not as common anymore. It can be done. It's just not as common. Thank you for that. The next question that we have in the chat is, can you talk about the most common cases you see? Uh, in my in my practice, it's it's really because it's in Grand Central, it's in New York, it's around a lot of gyms. I see a lot of athletic patients, runners, things of that nature. Uh, ankle sprains tends to be a huge thing here. You know, New York. If you've ever guys have ever been here, the roads are gross, right? There's potholes, it's bumpy, it's not straight. So runners a lot of times will sprain their ankles. And being that they're avid runners, they want to make sure it never hinders their progress. Okay, they're training for marathons. Um, they don't want to lose time. They don't want to miss out on these things. Fitness trainers as well. These are people who livelihoods literally depend on them being healthy. Can you imagine a fitness trainer coming in with a cast and crutches saying, all right, let's, let's go to work, guys. It's just, it's not going to happen. So anytime something happens with them, they come in right away. So that, that's the patient population I see. So it's mostly sports injuries, fasciitis, tendonitis, ankle sprains, stress fractures, things of that nature. Now, that'll vary from practice to practice. If you're in an area that's close to a retirement home, you're going to see more of the elderly clientele, correct? If you're in an area where it's full of diabetics, guess what? You're going to see more of the wound care type of patients. For me, this is just what I see personally. But again, I want to harp on the fact that it varies from place to place. Thank you. The next question is, what type of pre-med or pre-podiatry extracurriculars did you do as an undergraduate business major? Well, you have to take, so I'm pretty sure it's the same. When you take the MCATs or any med school or podiatry school, they have like a list of prerequisite classes, right? You have to take bio, you have to take orgo, you have to take calculus, uh, I believe it was physics, um, and I'm not sure what the other classes were. There's a list of, I believe, eight to 12 classes. So I did all my business uh, classes, and then I would add those on each semester just so I could fit the criteria but I didn't take any anything extra. It's not like if they required bio one and bio two, I said, oh, I'm gonna take advanced bio. No, I, I didn't do that. I, I had enough going on. I took the bare minimum of what was asked of me to take in order to get into school. Now, that because I took the business major just made most sense, but I'll be honest with you, people who were biology majors or chemistry majors and so forth, who probably did take anatomy one and two, who took microbiology, who took histology. When they came into their first year, they were much more prepared their first semester than I was because they were seeing all these things for the second time. Remember, I was seeing them for the first. I, I never saw these things. I was like, oh man. So I was learning them anew. So that's something you will have an upper edge going in. But once you get into your, like your second or third semester, that edge disappears. Um, so that's just a, a little note for you guys, but I didn't take anything extra on top of what I did. Now. Thank you. There's a question in the chat. Does emotional slash mental health play a part in taking care of podiatry patients? 100%. That's a great question, actually, because this is a topic that's, uh, I want to say relatively new. You guys may be adjusted to this being all around. However, when I was coming up, no one spoke about mental health, uh, anxiety, or any of these things. You kind of just went along with it, right? Now that you're older, you think to yourself, wow, you know, maybe this person was anxious and so forth. And when a, when a patient comes into you, you have to understand, you can't just get stuck looking at the foot and ankle. Oftentimes, we get caught up in that. We just look at the foot. Patient comes in, you don't even make eye contact. You're looking at the foot immediately. You have to understand there's a human behind this, okay? Um, and we all know that mental and emotional health plays a role in recovery. 
if you don't believe you're going to get better, you never will get better. You know, the surgery can be flawless, but in your head, you, you, you still feel like, no, something's off. OK, so you have to make sure these go hand in hand. Uh, let's just give an example of a patient who uh, is an athlete, correct? Going into their senior year, about to get heavily recruited, comes in, tears his ligament, just as the case I gave you before. You can't be blunt in the sense that, hey, listen, man, your season's over. We got to do surgery. I don't know what to tell you. It is what it is. You know, they, you're not going to help anybody by doing that. You have to understand that this person is going to be an emotional wreck. This is what they've worked their whole life towards. And it's coming to a, a speed bump. OK, so you have to understand that you have to sympathize, show some empathy and everybody wins if you if you're able to do that. And that's actually a great question. And if you build that characteristic or build that trait early on, I promise you, you're going to be a phenomenal doctor. Definitely. Uh, the next question is, what are the average hours of a podiatrist? And is there a part of podiatry that does not involve any surgical operations? Oh, yeah, you can have. So the thing with this podiatry is to graduate residency, you need to be surgically trained. That's it. It's period. We've moved on from chiropathy. You have to be surgically trained. No questions asked. Like, there's no way around it. However, when you go into the real world, you don't have to do surgery at all you can say hey i just want to do wound care hey i just want to treat ingrown toenails and ankle sprains and fractures but i don't want to do anything surgical based and there's a good portion of a really good portion of people who do that okay and there's nothing wrong with it you make a very good living as well all right some people uh will do surgery early on and say hey you know what it may not be worth the stress you know but I, surgery is very stressful you know if things don't go as planned you get complications if the patient is recovering as you thought it was, these things pile up on you. If you're just a normal human being and you want your patients to get better, it's going to weigh on you. But some people at a late age or early age say, you know, I, I can't handle that right now and I'm okay. So if you want to be non-surgical podiatrist, there's, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. There's many people who do that. In terms of the hours, the arrows vary, right? So are you working for somebody? Are you working for yourself? Do you dictate your own hours or does someone dictate those hours for you? Uh, a 40 hour work week is, is absolutely normal here. Some people do more, some people do less. Okay, it depends again, uh, what your situation is. It doesn't vary from any other job. Thank you for that. There's another question in the chat. Would you say that there's a difference of care when seeing a general ER doctor versus a podiatrist for a broken ankle and why? You know, it depends who the ER doctor is, right? So when we went to, we had three different hospitals in Philadelphia, you could see the, the stark difference between one ER doctor to another. Uh, one ER doctor will be very confident in reducing an ankle fracture and say, I got this, I'm going to sedate the patient, I'm going to reduce the deformity, I'm going to cast it, I'm okay. Another ER doctor will know their limits and say, oh, you know what, I'm not very comfortable with this, I'm just going to phone podiatry right away. Um, in terms of how to reduce an ankle fracture or how to treat it, uh, we're basically taught the same way. Emergency medicine is emergency medicine. I mean, you're, you're not going to change this. The concepts or the principles of reducing an ankle fracture and maintaining that reduction are the same regardless. Uh, but obviously, it varies from person to person. But no, I, I wouldn't say one is like superior or inferior to the other, rather than they know they both have to work together somehow. Thank you. The next question a student asked is, do you think that not being a U.S. citizen just yet affects your chances of getting accepted? No, no, no. Many of my friends aren't U.S. citizens. I, I wouldn't worry about that. Um, not at all. That's, that's, that's the blunt answer. Not at all. And when it comes to getting residency after that, there's a lot of residencies that sponsor non-citizens. So I, I wouldn't worry too much of that. Don't make that your limiting factor. Your road is a little bit tougher, but it's definitely not impossible at all. Thank you for that. Um, the next question in the chat, can you go through a standard patient visit? Like how do you, how do you interact with and diagnose your patients? Well, it depends what they're coming for. Let's just say they come in for heel pain, okay? Patient states, I have heel pain. All right, you, you get an adequate history, right? It's the same thing with any doctor. How long have you had the heel pain? What have you done for it? What makes it better? What makes it worse? things of that nature. Then you're going to have your physical exam, right? You're going to do your range of motions, muscle testing, whatever it may be. 
And then if needed, an x-ray. You know, most podiatry practices have in-office x-rays. You'll just make sure that there's no bony injuries and so forth. Now, based on your findings, you'll assess and make a plan. Uh, you may say, hey, I think you need to go in a boot. I think you need a compression dressing. I think you need to just rest. Hey, I, I don't see anything wrong with you. I think you're going to be fine. Uh, injection, so forth. Uh, the the backbone of treating a patient is the same in every field, right? History, physical, uh, diagnosis, and plan. It's not going to change. Thank you. The next question is, can you give us your advice on what you think makes a captivating personal statement? Uh, genuine. I mean, the, we used to read personal statements in residency because I know people think directors and big shots read your personal statements. They don't. They're not going to sift through all your personal statements. They tend to give them to the residents and the residents just file through them. And uh, being genuine will show. If you have a personal story, something that's just uh, unique to you, that's all you can do. I would just say for the personal statements, you know, if your resume is pretty solid, you have a good CV, uh, extracurriculars, the, the personal statement, even if you keep it dry, as long as it doesn't hurt you, you, you'll be fine. Okay. But in terms of captivating, I would just try to be as genuine as possible. Do you have any interview tips for people who might be going through um, interviews? Yeah. So interviews, you know, and, and this isn't just me being arrogant. I always felt like uh, interviews, you have to be yourself. Okay. Uh, if you have some sort of public speaking, like deficiencies or you're not as comfortable, trial runs. They practice all the time. I mean, take a friend, write up a few questions, don't tell each other what they are, and go for it. We used to do this. I used to interview my friends all the time. What was your favorite book? What was the last book you read? Just random questions out of the blue, just to make each other more comfortable. So when you do finally sit in that chair, you're like, hey, I've done this before. You know, there's nothing they could ask me that I haven't been asked already and I'm not prepared. A lot of these questions tend to be pretty standard. So if you prepare for them appropriately, you'll be ready, right? Why are you interested in podiatry? What made you interested in podiatry? What is your strongest uh, characteristic? What is your weakest characteristic? How do you work well with others? Do you see yourself working with others? You know, these are standard questions. If you prepare for them, it's like having the questions to an exam before you enter. You'll be okay. Thank you. Next question is, how many hours did you spend studying outside of classes in podiatric med school? All the time. All the time. Yeah. It was, um, I was studying in class. You do your classes. Once you get out of class, I, I would just study. The only breaks I ever took were after exam dates. So if we had an exam on Friday, I told myself I'm not touching anything on Friday. That's it. That's, that's my gift. But other than that, I was absolutely studying. But you have to understand, uh, I was really like a huge go-getter. I wanted to be the top of the class. I wanted to have the GPA. I wanted to have the CV. Now, there are certain people, and there's nothing wrong with that, who say, listen, I'll take my B, and I'll live comfortably. That's it. I want to go out on Saturday. I want to enjoy myself. I'll study on Sunday, and I'll move forward, okay? Um, for me, that wasn't my goal. I wanted to get the highest grade point average I possibly can and spice up my resume. So I'll be honest with you, I, I sacrificed a big chunk of my social life the first two years because that's where a chunk of your GPA is made. And then I enjoyed myself my third and fourth year. But yeah, my first and second year, if I wasn't um, in class, I was studying somewhere. Can you talk about your work hours pre-COVID and post-COVID? Uh, I'll be honest with you, pre-COVID, I was working, let's see, 10 hours on Monday, eight hours on Tuesday, eight hours on Wednesday. So we're at, uh, what is that, 26 now, and then uh, Thursday, another eight hours, and then eight hours on Friday. Um, so 32, so that's 42 hours pre-COVID. Um, Post-COVID, you know, it depends on what the schedule is looking like. I'll be honest with you, New York, we're still about... 45 to 50% capacity in terms of my patient volume. So although the hours may be close to being similar, the amount of patients I'm seeing is probably down by half. So COVID's definitely taken a toll in the New York City area, that is. I can't speak for the rest. Um, and hopefully things will turn around, you know. The next question is, did you have second thoughts while applying to uh, med school? All the time. Yeah, of course. It's one of the biggest decisions you'll ever make, right? Because you're about to sign in ink 
like this is it. This is what I'm going to be doing for the rest of my life. Do I want this burden of helping people get better? Do I want the responsibility of patient care, right? If you have a desk job, uh, it's a lot different when you could clock in nine to five and that's it. I'm not taking my work home with me. I'm done. You know, I don't have to do anything after that. Whereas when you're doing surgery or you're taking care of patients, you know, it's five o'clock. If, if your patient isn't doing well, that's going to linger on your mind. You're going to say, what can I do to make this person better? Um, so you think about these things. Am I making the right choice? Am I not making the right choice? Uh, and I think it's very natural. I think it's common to have these little anxiety moments. Okay. Uh, but you have to remind yourself why you're doing it. And that'll always reassure you that you're making the right choice. Kind of going off of that, did you ever experience imposter syndrome or feeling like you're not good enough? You know, imposter syndrome is like um, something new. I've never heard of it when I was in my training. I, I really didn't. I, I heard about it when I was in uh, just scrolling through social media. So I just want to be frank. Imposter syndrome means like you feel like you got to your place by luck and you're not as good as you think you are. Or is that correct? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, no, I'll be honest, no, you know, and it's not, it's not me belittling imposter syndrome. I think it's, it's an adequate concern, but you have to be confident, especially when you're a doctor, right? You put in the work, you earned it. There's no such thing as luck here. How, how can you possibly get lucky getting into medical school when everybody competed for your spot? How can you get lucky getting into residency when people competed for your spot? How can you get lucky diagnosing patients, getting those answers correct on exams. You didn't get lucky all those times. You earned it. You earned it. You're going to make mistakes along the way. Medicine is a never ending learning field. You're never going to stop learning, period. That's what you signed up for. Research changes, diagnosis change, medicine changes, pandemics happen, and you're going to have to learn about that, right? You're always going to make mistakes, okay? But being a doctor is telling yourself, hey, I'm going to learn from that mistake and it's only going to make me better. So I, again, imposter syndrome, something I just learned on the fly, but I can't say that I relate and I'm sorry. I don't want to offend anybody or anything, but just know if you got in this far, it's not by luck. You, you really got here because you put in the work period. Thank you for giving us all confidence. That was great. Sure. The next question is what key takeaways did you get from starting your own practice? It's hard. <laughs> it's really hard. I mean, it's, it's not easy. It's, it's not easy. I had this surreal idea and this was wrong of me is that I'm going to go to the best school. I'm going to get the best grades. I'm going to go to the best residency. I'm going to get the best training. And when I come out in private practice, everybody's going to run through the door because I'm the man. I, I worked it. I earned it. And that's not the case. You know, reality slaps you in the face very quickly. Private practice is very much a business. How well can you market yourself? You may be good, but do people know you're good? How are you going to get that message out there? You know, and that takes time, right? Because early on, you don't have the money to put into marketing or Google ads or whatever it may be, however you want to get there. Okay. Social media is a great tool, Instagram, right? It's a free tool and you could reach a mass audience and, and engage people. Okay. But how much is that really going to help? Um, and you learn these things along the way. But the biggest thing I learned in private practice the best marketing tool you could ever have is treating your patients right, okay? Word of mouth will always be the most superior referral marketing, period. Treat your patients right, slowly but surely, things will pick up for you. That's it, simple as that. Thank you, there's a question in the chat. Have you ever heard of the term broken leg depression and could you talk about it? I've never heard of it. I have no idea. Broken leg depression. I can't, I can't say that. I've heard of phantom pain. That's when someone, you know, uh, has an amputation, but somehow still feels the pain in the area with no uh, limb or toes there. But I've never heard of broken leg depression. I'm sorry. Uh, the next question is, I know you address the different specialties that you work with, but do you also work with NPs and or PAs? Not much. So in the hospital setting, 100%. So in the hospital setting, when we used to get paged in the ER, the PAs or the NPs would take care, to be quite honest with you. The PAs were like rock stars. They did everything. <laughs> um, and they were a pleasure to work with. Okay, They were always level grounded, humbled. Uh, I loved the PAs I interacted with. Uh, in the private setting, unless you're working in a multi-specialty group, you really don't interact with many uh, PAs or NPs. 
Um, when I do get patients cleared for surgery, sometimes the NP will relay the message from the primary care facility she works at, but I can't say I have much interaction with them. Um, there's a question in the chat. What does a good day look like for you versus a bad day? Uh, a good day is I woke up, I have my health, I'm alive. That's a great day. Uh, a bad day, I, I'm a pretty optimistic person. I don't like to call anything a bad day, but in, I'm guessing they're talking about in a private practice setting. You know, a good day is when you see a good volume of patients, right? Uh, not only a good volume of patients, but when your patients are genuinely satisfied with your care. I'm the type of person that I, I like to over criticize myself and my work. So if a patient's disgruntled or not completely satisfied, it'll run through my mind constantly. Why, why isn't this patient extremely happy? Why did this patient give me four stars and not five stars? What could I have done to get that five stars, you know? Uh, so a good day is when you see a bunch of patients, they're all happy with your care and you can put your head on the pillow and say, everything is fine. And a bad day is just having one disgruntled patient for me. If I have just one patient who is unhappy or is not recovering the way I'd like, it will ruin my week until they get better. Thank you. The next question is, do you have to deal with a lot of lawsuits and complaints from patients in a podiatry practice? Sure. So knock on wood, I have not been sued so far. <laughs> okay. But, uh, you know, all my mentors and everybody older than me says, if you do surgery enough, your time will come. You know, someone's going to come after you. You have to understand law when it comes to medicine. People can sue you for anything. Uh, they could say, I didn't like this guy's haircut, so I'm going to sue him. And they can. They can put up a lawsuit for that. All right. Um, but medical lawsuits are there. That's why we have malpractice insurance. Uh, they have to prove that you're negligent in your care. Uh, it's a very stressful thing to go through, right? Because you never want to feel like you harmed a patient, let alone intentionally harmed a patient. Um, so they do exist. If you do surgery more than others, then you'll probably be more exposed to it. If you're a non-surgical podiatrist, uh, then the chances are much slimmer than someone who's actually in the operating room. How do you handle stress and how did you handle stress in podiatry school? This is a great question because that was one of the biggest things you have to teach yourself because college was, you know, you had your stress, but college was, you know, you had people around you and you figured your way out that stress, whether it was going to the basketball courts or going out on a Friday, everything seemed to work itself out. Podiatry school was a different type of stress because it was nonstop. You were studying nonstop. You had examinations around the corner. And you're trying to figure out how to cope with distress, you know, and that's the toughest thing to deal with, um, especially in residency as well, when you're overwhelmed, again, overworked, underpaid, and you're thinking, oh, am I adequate, not adequate, whatever it may be. But the best thing I could say is my father gave me this advice once when I was venting to him. He said, listen, did you do the best you can? And I, I didn't understand what he meant. He goes, are you doing the best you can? I said, yes, I'm doing the best I can. He goes, then that's all anyone could ever ask for, right? But if you're not doing the best you can and you're stressed or you're failing or whatever it may be, then you only have yourself to beat up on. So I would just urge everybody, you know, your grades may not be the, the way you want them to be or things are over piling themselves on you. Just take a step back and ask yourself, is this the best I can do? And if the answer is yes, then don't beat yourself up over it. If the answer is no, then give yourself that little push you need to get over that. Definitely. The next question is, how did you cope with the change in workload between undergrad and podi um, podiatry school? Again, it's a tough transition. I'll be honest with you. It's, it's a really tough transition. It's not easy, right? You, you know, you go from doing business and some science classes to strictly all science classes. Um, there's no sympathy in podiatry school. It's like, hey, this is, this is the workload. Either learn it or don't learn it. Uh, I would say I used to take things one step at a time. So I would just set goals for myself. Okay. Today, I'm going to finish you know, studying histology. Tomorrow, I'm going to finish studying this and so forth and so forth. Um, that was the best thing I ever did for myself was, again, take a step back. Don't look at everything one step at a time, and you'll be surprised how efficiently you get through that list. Um, sorry, hold on. Um, Isaac, can you take over really quickly? Yes. Um, next question is, in med school and residence, what did you do to take care of your mental health when anxious, overwhelmed, or depressed? Yeah, you're definitely going to get anxious in, in med school and residency. I think everybody will experience some sort of anxiety or, you know, feeling down in, in those moments. Again, because you have a lot of expectations for yourself and things may not go your way one day, right? Especially if you have 
not so great attendings who beat you up on that. They may see you're down and some people will abuse you even further for it. Yeah, you suck. You're awful, man. Do better. Go open a book and read more, you know? And these are people who have their own issues. You have to understand that. And when you're older, you realize that. Like now, if someone were to ever tell me that, I'll say, man, I really feel sorry for you. But uh, it, then you're very impressionable. You don't know how to take it. You're going to take it to the heart. Um, again, you have to go back back home and it's the same thing I said is this the best I'm doing if the answer is then don't beat yourself up you know you're giving it the best and you could put your head on a pillow and say I tried my best I gave it my best that's all I got it's all anyone could ever ask of you thank you in your personal opinion what would you say was the hardest or like the toughest thing that you had to learn or study uh in terms of subject yes or just in general uh, in terms of subject, uh, I'm not sure what was my hardest class. I, mean, I really don't know, honestly. I, I just, uh, you study them as you go. I, I don't know if one was harder than the other. Um, but in terms of just the overall experience, was not beating yourself up all the time. Again, we mentioned this earlier, medicine's a never, never ending learning field. You're going to make mistakes. And for someone, especially for us in this field, we're accustomed to getting certain scores or being right a certain amount of the time. Uh, medicine's not always gonna be that case. You're gonna be wrong at times. So you have to teach yourself that, hey, when I am wrong, how is the best way I can react to this? And what am I learning from this experience rather than just put your head down and beat yourself up for the rest of the day. Uh, try to just ask yourself, what is this teaching me? And just make sure you don't make the same mistake, hopefully. Thank you. The next question is, how did you get patient care experience while in undergrad? Uh, you can shadow people. Undergrad, I didn't get much patient care experience. I'll be quite honest with you. Now, you could definitely, certainly, you could shadow people, go to the surgery center if they allow you, uh, go to their private practice and kind of gauge what their day-to-day -day is like, what the patient load is like, the quality, and so forth. Uh, shadowing is going to be crucial, especially if you're uh, second-guessing you. me. Again, it was orthopedic, sports medicine, podiatry. Well, what do I want to do? And shadowing was the answer that gave me all my answers. Uh, I would suggest you shadow multiple people. You don't shadow just one because if you shadow one, you have a skewed perspective of what that profession is like. You want to shadow multiple people and then put those experiences together and say, okay, I can make this assumption about this field. I'm in the chat dropped. For the surgery performed, can you talk more about it? Like how long the surgeries are usually? Well, that's the thing with podiatry, right? The foot and ankle, there's so many different things that could happen. And depending on how significant the surgery is will dictate how long it is and how good you are. You know, sometimes, uh, me personally, I like to take my time. I never rush, right? If this is somebody's foot. You're opening it open. Uh, once you close it and you stitch it back up, they may not be going back, all right? You may not get a second chance to fix up if you messed up anything. Some people are very efficient. They go fast and they're very happy. But again, it, de it depends on the case. If you're doing a little hammer toe, it's obviously going to take much less time than doing a reconstructed flat foot, right? So it could take anywhere from 10 minutes to three hours, four hours. Okay, it's a very broad question with a very broad answer. Thank you. The next question is, does the annual pay of a podiatrist vary based on specialties? That's a very good question. Um, there are some areas in podiatry that will pay more and you'll notice that very quickly. Wound care is a profitable field, right? Uh, managing diabetics uh, and taking care of their wounds uh, reimbursed as well. I mean, I'm not trying to look at patients as a financial cash cow or anything, but this is just based on what I've been reading. Um, but if you're going to gauge which specialty you go in based on finance, you won't be the doctor patients want to see, okay? One of the the best things I do is I never even check insurances. I never look at what they're covered. I, I don't, I don't want to know these things because uh, inadvertently, when you check someone's financial assets or financial covering, you're going to start to say, oh, wow, ultrasounds aren't covered. Well, I guess I'm not going to do an ultrasound then. Patient may need one. So I, I just don't check it. If, if I don't get paid for doing an ultrasound, then so be it. I lost five, 10 minutes of my time. Okay. Um, but yes, there are different pay rates for different procedures, which accounts for the different uh, specialties in podiatry. Did you ever consider other healthcare uh, fields, like PA or just any career in general? No, it was, it was either, you know, really growing up, it was either orthopedics or sports medicine. Again, podiatry was something I learned as in college, and it just made sense for me to go there. 
but no, I did not think about any other uh, field. What other specialties like podiatry are also flexible to balance between having a family and being a physician? I, I'm sure there's a lot of other fields. I can't speak to that, right? Because I didn't pursue every field in medicine. Um, my sister's in internal medicine. She has a great work-life balance, right? Um, so th there's many other fields. And again, if you're in private practice, it's, it's all on you, right? You dictate what you want to do. If you want to work 20 hours and make 80 grand a year and say, I'm happy, good for you. That's your choice. Uh, when you're in private practice, you have that choice. However, uh, if you're not in private practice, then you don't have that choice. Someone in the chat uh, dropped, can you describe what it was like going from learning in the classroom to then seeing patients and applying what you have been learning? Oh, that's, that's a very good question. If you're studying hard enough, obviously it'll come like nature, you know, oh, this is what we've talked about. This is the tendonitis, this is fasciitis, this is uh, equinus, and so all the pathologies that we see. Um, so again, you're not taking these classes preclinical just to waste your time or weed out the classes. You're taking them for a reason. And if you try to understand what they're trying to teach, once you jump into the clinical setting, it all makes sense. Whereas if you're just memorizing it just for the sake of memorizing it and you jump into the clinical setting, it's going to be new again. You're going to say, oh, yeah, I, I don't remember that. Because if you start treating everything like a test question, you're not going to thrive in the clinical world. Thank you. The next question is, can you give an in-depth analysis of a surgery you've performed? Again, that's a very, it's a very broad question, right? Um, so the last surgery I did was yesterday. It was someone with what we call a plantar plate tear. Now you guys have all seen that. You have two toes here. The second toe drifts and goes over the first toe, okay? It's called a crossover toe. Basically, there's a ligament that tears on the outside here, which causes the toe to drift this way. So what you have to do is expose that ligament by breaking a bone, distracting the joint, and then reattaching that ligament with sutures. Once the ligament is ready to be reattached, you put the toe down as much as possible and you reattach it that way. And then the recovery period is anywhere from four to six weeks to assure that the ligament heals appropriately. Um, now, this is just one surgery, right? There's many, there's thousands of different procedures you could talk about. Um, but again, that's the, that's the uniqueness of podiatry, right? It's not just cut and dry all the time. Someone in the chat asked, where do you see podiatry going into the next 10 years? I see it only expanding. If you look at podiatry, right, they went from being chiropodists to doing forefoot surgery. Now they do rear foot surgery, they do ankle surgery, and in some states in the country, they could work up to the hip. So I think when it comes to the lower extremity, podiatrists will have no boundaries to what they can do. Is there anything in medicine that goes against your moral beliefs? No, uh, you know, the, the, the Hippocratic Oath is do no harm. So do no harm, that's it. Um, there's a question in the chat. You briefly mentioned about the pressure of being the oldest son in an immigrant family. Did you get any pressure into choosing other careers? No, no, no. You know, it's just the, the pressure was, hey, I, I, you know, I don't have the, the leisure, the, the ability to just kind of wait this out and kind of figure out what I want to do in life. It was like, hey, I need to hit the real world is sooner than later. So that was certainly there. And again, that's the career and life balance that you're going to be going through as you go through these moments. Um, and uh, everybody will figure it out somehow. But I, I would highly suggest that, you know, don't look at things through one tunnel. Ask yourself, what is this beneficial for and what is this beneficial for? career, life, and then balance the two and make the decision that makes most sense. Thank you. The next question is, do you ever have to relearn how to do a surgery before you perform it? Um, you know, I'm, I'm still relatively young in my career, right? I'm only three years post-residency, so everything's kind of fresh in my brain. But I can imagine if you haven't done a case in a couple years, it would be good to refresh it on it before you go in. Uh, there are cadaver labs that certain uh, companies will offer if you ever wanted to go in and, and uh, refresh up your memories. But uh, usually if you have to do that, you know, it's not a good sign to begin with, right? Um, someone in the chat dropped, can you talk about your undergrad um, college? Like what school you went to? I went to a very small school, St. Francis College. It's in Brooklyn, New York. Again, I got a full scholarship there. I, I, I got accepted to bigger universities. 
Um, but the long-term goal, knowing that I wanted to do medicine, I knew this was going to be a long haul. Uh, and uh, the business aspect of me said, okay, if I take some sort of loan pre, you know, graduate school, that loan's only going to build up debt during my medical school studies. It's going to build up debt during my residency and who knows till when. So I just took the one that made most financial sense. So I went to a very small school called St. Francis College, whose motto is uh, the small school of big dreams. So, uh, and I enjoyed every minute of it. I really did, so. Thank you. The next question is, how often would you say that the information in podiatry is changing? Um, I think the, the backbone of podiatry on what you do day to day will stay the same for a long time but surgical techniques are always evolving. Uh, how rapidly they evolve, I'm not sure, but you know, that's why you stay in touch with uh, research articles and so forth. There's a question in the chat. Did you conduct surgical training on cadavers mostly or synthetic body parts and how did the experience differ? Uh, well, we did a lot of cadaver training, right? A lot of cadaver training. You know, when you're picking residencies, one of the things I wanted to make sure they had was a cadaver lab. So you could go there at any time and work on your surgical technique. And then you take what you learned in the cadaver lab and you know, with the supervision of an attending, you'll be working on patients in a hospital setting. That's what residency is for. Now, if you go to a residency that's very high volume, obviously you'll get more practice than a residency that's lower volume. Thank you. The next question is, did you partake in any research while in undergrad or in podiatry school? Yeah, I, I, in podiatry school, I did a lot of research. I think I authored eight articles, eight papers, maybe, or nine. I'm not sure of the number. I haven't done much research since. But again, at that time, I wanted to spice up my resume as much as possible, right? I wanted my CV to be nice and bulky. So uh, yeah, I did a lot of research in my podiatry school. Um, some people in the chat are asking if you took a gap year. I did not take a gap year. I, I, I worked uh, all the way through. I wanted to, again, graduate as fast as possible and begin to work as soon as possible. But a gap year can be a, a really beneficial thing, especially if you're taking it to uh, do research or more importantly, honestly, I think the biggest reason someone would take a gap year is MCAT. I mean, if you're saying, hey, I'm going to take a gap year and just work on my MCAT, it's a smart move, you know, in my opinion. Do you have any advice for getting into research, either in undergrad or in postgrad? So I would approach anyone who you see is doing it, right? So if you see there's a, a teacher, a professor, an attending who's producing a lot of papers, and that was the case in podiatry school, there was one teacher who just was, every other day was a poster or a paper. You approach them and you say, hey, I'm very interested. I'm willing to be just an assistant, just starting off. I, you don't have to put my name on any articles if you like. I just want to learn. And eventually they're going to follow you in. Now, the sooner you do this, the sooner you'll get started. That's exactly how it worked for me. I, you know, I just approached someone, told them, hey, I'm just interested. Can I just be a bystander? And eventually um, they'll take you in. Someone in the chat asked if you prefer a hospital setting more or a private practice? Uh, private practice, just because you're in more control of your own destiny. Whereas in a hospital setting, uh, again, it's a hospital setting. The next question is, did you ever witness in medical school any of your peers dropping out or failing out? Yeah, we had about a 25% attrition rate. So a lot of people, you know, for academic reasons, didn't make it through the next years. Or a lot of people just said, uh, hey, this isn't for me. You know I, know, I know a couple of students in my class who after the first or second year said, you know what, I really don't want this. <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with that, right? You'd rather make that decision early on than later on. You don't want to be 20 years in going, wow, I messed up. <laughs> So yeah, some people will fail out just pure academia. Others will just say, hey, you know what? I did it, I didn't like it, time to move on. Do you think your business, oh, sorry, let me rephrase that. Has your business degree helped you in medical school or in like your practice now? In my practice now, certainly, yeah, yeah. In my practice now, you could apply a lot of the things you learned in college to what you're doing now. In medical school, not even one bit, no. <laughs> there was no nothing that I can relate to med school in terms of business. Again, this is something I, I felt like was interesting at the time. And um, I just needed a fallback option. As we mentioned earlier, I said, hey, if God forbid medicine doesn't work out, what can I see myself doing? And business was the second thing. 
Thank you. The next question is, um, are there any medically related books that you would recommend? I've, I've read every single book written by Atul Gawande. Um, he's my favorite author. Uh, I also read a book called uh, The House of God. That's just classic. Uh, I think the show, I never watched the show, but the show Scrubs was based off that book. Um, that's a book you'll read in one or two days. I can't imagine you putting that book down, but those books will help keep you sane 100%. And if they don't, then maybe medicine isn't for you after all. <laughs> um, going off of that, do you have any articles or scientific research that you recommend people reading? No, it depends again, what, what kind of field you want to go into, right? So if I were to interview for a certain program, I would read any papers that were published by that program, right? Because you want to know what their strengths are and what they're proud about. Um, again, it depends which field. If you're going into vascular, you want to read vascular studies. If you want to go into podiatry, you're going to read certain pod pod podiatry studies. Uh, that's a very broad question, and it's going to be tailored to whatever your interests are. Thank you. Um, another broad question is, do you have any interview tips? Practice, right? Practice makes perfect. I mentioned this earlier. Uh, my friend and I would just throw random questions at each other and we'd be very brutal, like very brutal. I mean, left field questions, right field questions. We didn't care. So when we got into the interview, it was just nothing we haven't seen before. Practice, practice, practice. And I feel like that's something that goes under the radar. People just go into an interview for the first time. I, no, this is an open book test. They're going to ask the same questions they ask all the time. Ask residents before you or students before you, what did they ask when you went? And just prepare and go in there. Going off of my past question, do you have yeah. any articles in podiatry that you recommend people reading? Uh, yeah, anything I wrote. It's very broad. I would look up the Foot and, uh, Foot and Ankle International. I look them up every week and I just read whatever they have. That's probably one of my favorite magazines. Do you have any specific recommendations for those looking to get into podiatry for them to do in their gap year? A shadow, 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 shadow. Build that network of connections now. I mean, if you have a gap year and you're waiting to go into podiatry school, don't let it go to waste. Follow random podiatrists, go to their offices, ask questions, get comfortable, yeah. Um, you've said that you write, um, how is that process like for you? What is? Uh, writing articles. Sorry if you can't hear me. Oh, uh, no, it's okay, it's okay. Um, you know, I haven't done it since podiatry school. That was a major, all my research articles were written then, okay. Uh, it's stressful, right? It's a lot of trial and error, right? You're drafting, redrafting, redrafting. You're submitting, right? When you submit to these uh, papers, um, they'll sometimes bring it back and say, we didn't accept it. And these are the reasons we don't accept your article. So now you got to go back to square one, fix everything they mentioned and resubmit it. Um, it's, it's not as easy as one, two, three. So it's pretty stressful, but um, it's always a good feeling when you finally get published. When would you recommend starting shadowing or volunteering? And would you recommend that as early as high school? Yeah, sure. Sure. I mean, th this, is your, this is the future you're deciding for yourself, right? So wouldn't you rather know sooner than later? Uh, you may shadow a podiatrist in high school and say, uh, I don't want this. That's better than shadowing them in college and saying, oh, wow, I really don't want this, right? So I would say the sooner the better. You kind of want to open your eyes to everything that's out there. Uh, the more you experience, the more you know. Again, I didn't know what podiatry was till college. Now, imagine if I would have done my homework in high school, maybe I would have set myself better. Uh, but uh, again, yeah, the earlier, the better. Sorry, I think I'll take over. So for the next question is, can you talk about the specific technologies you use as a podiatrist? Oh, there's a lot of technology, right? Um, whether it be laser therapy, shockwave therapy, ultrasounds. Um, then in the surgery, there's a huge, there's a huge, ment a huge bunch of surgical instrumentations you work with, whether it be screws, wires, plates, staples. Um, these are things you have to get comfortable with, right? Because you have to be able to adapt. Uh, I'm sure five years from now, they're going to have new technology out there that I have to learn and take my courses and play with them, make sure I'm comfortable with them. Uh, so again, it's a very broad question. There's a lot of things we use on a day-to-day -day basis. 
Thank you. The next question is, can you explain more of the process for evaluating someone complaining about general ankle pain when they walk? Um, okay, so if someone comes in with ankle pain, again, you take a, a proper history, right? Uh, when did this happen? Do you recall any trauma? Where does it hurt? Does anything make it better? What makes it worse? Have you taken any medications? Uh, it'll then have an exam, right? You'll tend to palpate the area that they're complaining of. You'll follow the anatomic structures, whether it be tendons, ligaments, the bone. Uh, if required, you'll take an x-ray, see if the x-ray show anything. Then depending on all the information you've gathered, you'll make an assessment and the plan will reflect off of the assessment. Um, everybody's different, right? Not everybody walks in with the same type of ankle pain, but that's the general gist of uh, my workup. And that's for every, everybody that walks in, not just ankle pain. Thank you so much for talking to us. Do you have any last minute advice to pre-med students or pre-health students in general? Um, you know, just be confident in what you're pursuing, right? You've worked hard enough to get to this point. You've made the decision that this is for you. Uh, and there's uh, just believe in yourself, really. I know that sounds as corny as possibly can. It's very cliche. But again, if you put in the work, you will see the reward. That's the beauty of this field, right? It's not like sports. And again, I'm going to reference sports because I love sports. Sports, you may sometimes work as hard as you can, and you'll never be Jordan, right? You'll never jump as high. You'll never have the best shot, or you'll never... Uh, have the athletic ability that some of these people have. This is medicine, okay? If you read hard enough, if you study hard enough, if you watch lectures hard enough, you can be anything you want. You can be the best doctor you can, okay? And that's not gonna be reflective of any CV or any GPA or anything, these parameters that people use to judge you on. That's gonna be you, 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 and you. And the only person's opinion that matters is the patient you treat. Thank you so much, Dr. Ramawi. That was oh, a wonderful you. virtual shadowing session. For all of my students, um, stick around for uh, the end of this presentation. I'll be going over how to get your certificate verifying your virtual shadowing hours today. Um, my first announcement is this is a different QR code than the one I presented at the beginning of the session. This is actually to join our fundraising team. So we are asking all of you guys to scan this QR code and please join our fundraising team. Um, if you guys cannot um, donate um, and support us financially, we ask that you support us um, in helping get financial donations. Um, and so this will take you to the Join the Team um, fundraising page. Once you guys are there, you can actually get certified virtual shadowing um, volunteer hours. And so to do this, you share 15 times with 15 people and you guys can get an hour of volunteering hours for this. So if you're interested, I will share uh, information on how to sign up to be a volunteer. Um, but in the meantime, please help us keep this program alive. We are struggling with keeping the website up currently, as you may have noticed with our um, website errors um, crashing recently. Um, so this is our initiative to keep it alive. We're gonna skip the reflection for today. Just make sure that you guys are reflecting. I know that you guys are all taking good notes. Um, so just make sure this is, you know, what you guys are gonna be writing for maybe your personal statement or your activities. You're gonna have to have good reflection on this. And so set yourself up for success. Um, you know, what did you learn? What are your key takeaways from today? Uh, make sure that you're keeping track of that because it will serve you in the future. If you guys are interested, uh, Free Health Shadowing is a student-led, student-based team. And so if you're interested in becoming a part of the Free Health Shadowing family, you can apply. Uh, this is 100% remote. You have the opportunity to meet with like-minded students um, and gain professional experience that will serve you in the future. And it looks great on applications. And so during COVID, it's really, really hard to just get shadowing hours, but now you're isolated. Um, you're in your own environment. and so. What, a, what better way than to meet people in different parts of the country and parts of the world um, who have similar goals than you. If you guys um, are unsure if you can apply to be on the team due to time constraints, we understand you guys are all pre-health students and you have a lot going on. We have volunteer opportunities um, that are 100% on your own time. So if the only time you have is at two in the morning, you are more than welcome to help out at two in the morning. Um, so you can work as many or as little hours as you want, completely remote, um, and you get certified hours for this. 
Um, my next announcement is to stay updated with the upcoming sessions. You can follow us on Instagram to get every single one of our shadowing sessions. And I have a challenge for you today. And this is to go to our Instagram and find Dr. Ramawi's post. You're gonna comment his last name letter by letter. This is really hard just because of the way that the algorithm works. So good luck with this. We'll be picking a student to be the spotlight student of the session. Don't forget to tag us in your social media posts. If you guys attended pre-health shadowing, go ahead and let everybody know. This isn't a secret. Um, if you tag us, you have the opportunity to be posted on our official page. And so make sure that you guys are tagging at pre-health shadowing. Our next session is tomorrow. We have a week of shadowing for you all. So tomorrow at four o'clock p.m. Pacific Standard Time, I'm sorry, that should say p.m., my apologies. Uh, we will be having um, Gabriela DeVita, who is a PA. And last but not least, to take the post-shadowing assessment to get your verified virtual shadowing hours, you're going to want to go to our website. Once you get to our website, you're gonna see the speaker, um, the course, you're gonna see Dr. Ramawi. To the right of his picture, you're going to see free take this course. Once you click that, you will have 30 minutes to complete the assessment. You have two tries to get over a 70%. Once you pass with a 70%, even if it's just a 70 and you wanted a 100, if you are able to get your certificate, please download it immediately. If you decide to take the assessment again and happen to not pass it the second time, your eligibility does go away. So please be mindful of that when taking the assessment. Um, and once you are done with that and you pass, you are going to return to the speaker's page and click finish course. This is a crucial step. If you do not click finish course, you will not be receiving your certificate. So please be sure that you guys are doing this. I recommend since the website has been going down recently and we are trying to keep it up as best we can, I recommend to you not to log on immediately. Make sure um, if you are logging on later, the video will be posted within 24 hours of the session end time if you wanted a refresher. I recommend try logging in in 15 minutes, try logging in in an hour. If we can try to space the amount of students that we have on the website, that will increase the chances of it not crashing. I apologize for any inconveniences. This is temporary until we get the funding to keep all of our um, technological platforms running smoothly. So I appreciate anything you guys can donate, as many shares as you can. Um, thank you all for joining us today. If you have any issues with the quiz, feel free to email us at info at prehealthshadowing.com and we'll do our best to get back to you as soon as we can. Thank you all for joining us today and that is the end of this virtual shadowing session. You are invited to disconnect from the call. Oh, we're great. Awesome. That was great. Thank you so much, Dr. Ramawi. Thank you for having me. Oh, I'm glad you enjoyed it. I'm not sure if it went. I felt like I cut the beginning off a little too early, but to be honest, uh, I, I panicked a little bit when I saw the chat reach like 99. I was like, <laughs> oh my God, are we going to get through all of this? I said, okay, maybe we could go to questions right now and uh, get everybody home at a decent hour. Um, but I hope, I hope they found it beneficial. Yeah, definitely. Um, team, do you guys want to add anything before we wrap it up? That was a great presentation. Thank you for your time. Oh, anytime. Thank if you, you guys need presenting. anything, you know, I know this, this these times are stressful and you guys are trying to do something unique and I applaud that. I always love like uh, people thinking outside the box, right? Everybody tries to stay into this realm of, you know, school, CV, volunteer, da da da, whatever. I love people who go outside. This is a great platform. If you need anything from me, just let me know. Uh, I'm going to be sure to donate to your GoFundMe. All right, guys. Thank Worry you so it. much. Yeah, Thank you course, so much. Course. And if you need anything in the, the future, uh, you guys have my information, right? Thank you so much.